The following video is packed with spoilers for Resident Evil Village. I think it's a great game and being a horror game, it's best experienced blind. With that being said, I didn't make this video hoping it'd be a complete comprehensive review. Rather, I found the game to be a good vehicle to talk about a couple different topics I wanted to touch. This video is an opportunity for me to nitpick, but it is just as much an opportunity for me to praise a game I had a ton of fun with. I will be comparing Village to previous Resident Evil games in small ways, because this video is also my love letter to one of my new favorite franchises in gaming. Now let's begin at the beginning. Unfortunately, Village opens up with one of my least favorite tropes in gaming, a long, unskippable story segment. I'm not going to sit here and tell you carrying Rose into bed is bad or anything. It's great for establishing Ethan's relationship with his family and getting the player attached to the okay. baby they'll chase I'll throughout the game. The long, cold trek to the village is a well-made thriller to build up tension to your first enemy encounter as well. I'm glad I experienced it when I first played. However, the next three times I played the game, I just grew increasingly bored. It especially hurts when you know nothing will touch you until you reach the village. Thankfully, I like Village's story, and you can speed through the whole thing in about 20 minutes. However, I still don't see why there's no option to start at the village on a New Game Plus account. I can get behind starting each run with Carrying Rose because it's far shorter and the far more interesting part of the intro, but the long trek has diminishing returns. A lot of my favorite games throw you straight into the action. Resident Evil 4 is a strong example. After two skippable cutscenes and 10 seconds of walking, you're face to face with your first enemy and a small horde waiting for you a minute later. I've heard people describe 4 as endlessly replayable, and I would agree, wholeheartedly because of its gameplay first execution in regards to its pacing. Even Resident Evil 1 got to your first enemy faster, and 1 was a slow paced game that focused more on atmosphere. The fact that there's a dozen different guns in Village tells me it's a lot closer to 4, despite how long lonely walks with no enemies is part of the gameplay loop. In many ways, Village tries to balance and encompass all of its predecessors, for better or worse. Ammo management has always been a core to the Resident Evil franchise. There's nothing quite like the simple pleasure in reorganizing case or the rush of being forced to use a sniper rifle close quarters because you're fresh out of all of their ammo. Like most Resident Evil games, Village does a great job at this. One of the most impactful changes made to ammo management in Biohazard that carried over to Village is crafting. Personally, I think I prefer when you have to work with whatever ammo you're given, like in previous Resident Evil games, but I do find the crafting to have a lot of benefits. For one, it's very in the spirit of Resident Evil and its history of resource management, and secondly, it makes it easier to do challenge runs. If you want to go through the game using only one type of gun, you can pool your resources into ammo for that one gun, or even forego guns altogether and stick to consumable explosives only. It's not exactly hard to do this in older games too, it's just easier and it adds more replay value to the game. I do think there's a missed opportunity here though. As the game is, nothing can stop a player from crafting the second they run out of ammo mid-fight. If players were only allowed to craft a while at the Duke's shop or at save points, they'd be forced to think ahead and it would help the game to be more immersive, if only because it would cut down on menu use mid-fight. The only real complaint I have for Village is that the cases are too big. In my several playthroughs, I only ran out of inventory space once, and only because I had no idea how much space meat and fish took up. Sorting out a briefcase can be tedious, but personally I always enjoyed it. While we're still on ammo management, there's a few details I want to appreciate in Village. Crows only need one bullet to kill and they offer a decent amount of cash, meaning that even if the worst player in the world is stuck with barely any resources, they can not slowly but safely restock in the Village. I love the balancing with the Krambit knife and the basic ghoul enemies. The Krampet Knife can be bought in New Game Plus and it does just enough damage to safely stagger and stop the weakest ghoul enemies one on one. Normally these guys would soak up a handful of handgun bullets, but players who don't let fear get the best of them can save that handful for later. The Hand Cannon is an interesting post game unlock. It's a magnum gun that uses rifle bullets instead, which is much easier to get. It makes the higher difficulties more manageable, but having two mechanically distinct guns that share a pool of ammo is an interesting concept especially for a survival horror game. I'd love to see a sequel where this idea is played with more. If taken far enough, it could lead to multiple different ways to build a character throughout a playthrough. Merchants throughout all of Resident Evil games have a limited amount of ammo in stock, if at all. Meaning that even if you're on New Game Plus with all the money in the world, you can't buy your way through a campaign. The final boss does something really interesting too, but I'll save that for her section later. The castle being one of the few areas you can't return to felt odd at first. It's so big and looks so nice that it would have been easy to cram an optional mini boss in here. The same is true for the factory, but that's because at that point, the final stretch of the story takes focus. But this did make me appreciate Lady D more upon playing. 
From the bedroom scene until her boss fight, she and her daughters constantly patrol the area. Meaning that snooping around for items is always risky. There's never a completely safe time to sweep the entire castle. And that means risk is necessary to get as much inventory out of the castle as possible. I think that's interesting. Although there is one time when it's completely safe, but I don't think you'd normally ever guess when that is unless you get help from the community. The castle is the popular pick for the best area in the game, and it's easy to see why. It's got a great layout with a good deal of puzzles to spice things up. And a group of memorable bosses roaming around, whom collectively have thousands of posts on Rule 34. And to top it off, the encounters are tightly woven. Take Lady D for example. As soon as you get a key, she's going to be ready to ambush you right in front of the door it unlocks. It creates a very memorable experience on your first playthrough. Even minor areas like the wine cellar are memorable for making the weakest goons somewhat of a threat thanks to the extra camouflage. Overall, the castle is reminiscent of early Resident Evil games. Alongside the castle, the four other areas of the game all feel very distinct in aesthetics and gameplay. The Benevito Residence is a puzzle area where you can't fight back at all. Losing your guns and getting this long, unsettling buildup easily made this the scariest part of the game. I love how much I hate this stupid baby. Survival horror games are creepy and disgustingly fun, but because you're still fighting off hordes of enemies, genuinely chilling moments can be hard to create. At least a lot harder than in a game where you're forced to hide and run beginning to end. So even if it's a pain to replay, I'm glad it's part of the game. Unfortunately, the lake feels thin compared to the other areas. The beginning gives you three separate encounters only to give you a linear obstacle course and a boss fight with nothing in between. Even running from Moro isn't particularly unique because of both Lady D before him and the Sturm encounters later on. The Lycan Den and Factory are incredibly combat heavy. With the end of the game approaching, this difficulty spike is appropriate. You'll face Lycan in greater numbers than ever along with some new heavy hitters. I'd always build up a large amount of ammo heading into this part of the game only to be running dry partway through which highlights both the combat and the survival elements. And then there's the quiet village being the hub that connects them all, changing slightly every time you return to it. And constantly returning to that abandoned village is an important part of the pacing. Resident Evil games vary greatly in how they pace themselves. As I previously mentioned, the first Resident Evil was an atmospheric slow burn that was only broken up by the goofy cutscenes. 4 through 6 rarely let up on the action though. They put their gameplay first and foremost and Village breaks up the action with slow, lonely walks between encounters. But one thing I loved about the game's pacing was the brief moments of levity that are completely optional. Chasing chickens or fish in first person is just inherently silly. And when you bring their meat back to the Duke, you get to share a delightful meal with him. His cheeky dialogue is nice comic relief. He's your only friend in this journey, and those moments make him warming up to Ethan during the climax more believable. And each area has one of those lovely ball puzzles. Mini arcade games within larger games always manage to tickle my nostalgia center. It almost feels like a tribute to the medium's early history. It's goofy and out of place in the setting, but these small moments of simple joy in an otherwise lonely game help make a playthrough more digestible. While we're still on the subject of pacing, I want to talk about elevators next. As graphics become more and more advanced, the time it takes to load them increases. And one tactic devs use to mitigate this is by hiding load screens typically behind an unskippable cutscene, a long walk, or an elevator. And this is kind of clever. But one thing many others have pointed out is that these hidden load screens make games age worse. As rendering speeds increase, what once was a minute long load can become a couple seconds. But hidden loads will stay a minute long because of the elevator or the unskippable cutscene used to hide them. It's short-sighted. However, Village and other horror games can most easily get away with this. Because long lonely treks are part of the gameplay loop, elevators fit right into that. Being trapped in a small box and forced to wait quietly can easily build up tension in a player's head. It even allows games to pull off sequences like this. It's cliche, but it's effective and economical. Even in the first Resident Evil, you don't need the 5 seconds it takes to open each door when moving between rooms, but it does add to the atmosphere of the game. There's no such thing as a universally bad idea, it just needs the right place to be used. That being said, the block feels lackluster as a mechanic, mostly because the impact feels weaker than it should. Not every time, but most times. But I think it offers a reasonable middle ground given Resident Evil's history. When it came to defensive options, you only had running and consumable defensive items in the early games. But 6 had a pretty intricate dodge system. Dodging forward, backward, and sideways all had different animations and recovery positions. This was fun to play around with, especially the back dodge and how it would let you shoot in a crawling stance. However, it's also the apex of Resident Evil's slow shift from horror to action. 
4 is to blame for starting that shift, but if I had to equate their general vibes to movies, I'd say 4 was Evil Dead while 5 and 6 felt like Michael Bay movies. Even the survival setup started making less sense. Instead of being a lone survivor scrounging for items in an isolated location, you were a military unit that constantly had contact with the rest of the militia, in occupied cityscapes no less. Yet you would still be scrounging for bullets and grass to eat. Village tries to incorporate these aspects too, mainly with the time you play as Chris Redfield mowing down hordes of lichen and air striking bosses. Like I said, for better or worse, Village tries to incorporate elements from all of its predecessors. I definitely would have preferred to continue playing as Ethan and for the final run through the village to be a more traditional ambush and counter setup in line with the rest of the game, but this is what we have and I don't hate it, but I don't love it. It's a tricky balancing act, but I think the block in Biohazard and Village, while not a perfect solution, is probably the best choice. Not just because we change perspective to first person and dodging in first person might be a little weird when you can't move that fast, but it works logically with Ethan because he's a super durable moss man in canon. Hard to kill, but not a super powered badass like some of the bosses. If any Resident Evil protagonist could get away with blocking, it would be him. The block can't perfectly prevent damage like dodging, it can only mitigate damage. And the image of putting up your hands to stop a lichen from biting your neck makes you feel more helpless than dodging and cartwheeling around enemies. The intention is obviously to depower the player while still giving them some options to work with. I barely had to use the block in my first playthrough, but on higher difficulties it can save you a great deal of health. It also negates one of my nitpicks, the lengthy attack and grab animations enemies have. I was pretty quick to roll my eyes at this at first. It's not scary after the first couple times and that's always applied to these games. But again, it's hard to deny they have their place. It's funny that my greatest incentive for blocking was so I could save myself from spending 10 seconds in an animation I found annoying. It's such a weird back and forth between things I don't love mitigating things I don't like about Village. Which is why I called it a reasonable middle ground. If we're still sticking with a first person perspective, I hope the block is present in the next Resident Evil game. Looking at this block animation for so long has definitely made you see one of my favorite details about Village, Ethan's left hand. Plenty of horror games use a first person view primarily to pull you into the protagonist's perspective and to limit your field of view, but the simple addition of removing two of Ethan's fingers adds a pervasive unease to tons of interactions. Pushing shelves, opening doors, cutscenes, and my favorite, the healing animation. This animation looks like it stings and that's perfect. Pouring chemicals onto your three fingered hand over and over is exactly the type of weird freaky imagery that more horror games should look for. It's the type of disgusting grit that drew me to the horror genre to begin with. Not to mention Ethan's ring finger being the one bitten off has obvious symbolism given the game's theme of family. Even though the finger is mostly gone, the ring is still there under all the bandages. The ring represents his family. It's out of sight, but Ethan is trying desperately to heal it, to keep it together. While well, on the topic of Ethan's character design, I want to bring up another interesting point. Ethan has no face. Obviously there's no need for him to have one, 99% of the gameplay in cutscenes takes place in first person. But the final few cutscenes is shot from a third person view, and Ethan's face is conveniently always out of shot. You can take a look at his model in the archives, but all you'll find is a cartoonishly large shadow over his face. In free range camera, his model literally has no head. Ethan is an avatar for the player with just enough of a personality to be given voice lines. At first, this was hilarious to me. I love how hard they stuck to this bit. But at the same time, it got me rethinking those final moments of the game. There's no reason it couldn't have stayed in first person. Maybe it's simply changing to third person to signal a transition to Rose's POV. Her DLC is played with the over the shoulder camera and we get more shots of Ethan in third person. But because Rose is still a baby and isn't aware of what's happening yet, I still believe the game is implying something happened to Ethan's appearance by breaking into third person. According to Duke, Ethan is falling apart after coming back to life, and that goes double after his fight with Miranda. Ethan may very well look like an inhuman zombie cracking at the seams in these moments. This interpretation makes the scene more potent, I think. Not only would it highlight how much Ethan suffered to save Rose, it would also feed into the game's larger themes. Being inhuman is no excuse for being a poor parent. Nothing can excuse that. Which brings me to our next talking point. The villains in Village... <laughs> the villains in Village. The villains in Village continue Barhazard's themes of family. Mother Miranda builds a family but mistreats them all because the only child she actually cares about is her dead one. At first glance, Lady D appears to be a mature authority figure. 
She's a mother herself, and because you're forced to run from her 90% of the time, she sells that authority. But by the end, it's hard not to see her as an overgrown child. She gets easily upset and jealous whenever Miranda shows favor to anyone else, and throws tantrums when she doesn't get her way. You can find a note in her bedroom where she whines about not being Miranda's clear favorite. If I had to compare her to anyone, it'd be the Queen of Hearts from Alice in Wonderland. An overgrown spoiled child with the strength and authority to bully fully grown men. She likely became this way because she showed the most promise as a vessel. Miranda probably gave her the castle and tons of affection at first, thinking she would be her new Ava, only to grow distant after seeing her flaws develop later in life. Donna is the most overtly childish of the group. Unlike Lady D, she has no pretense of trying to act like a grown-up, quite the opposite in fact. She'd rather be seen as a tiny doll, a mischievous little girl. She's starved for attention. Her dolls are her only friends, and she's just a child looking for a playmate. Miranda doesn't care to waste time on her, and none of the other siblings get along with each other. Her area is a puzzle area because she doesn't want to fight, she just wants to force Ethan to play with her. She even mentions about wanting to replace Rose as Ethan's daughter. In case the giant baby monster didn't make it clear, it's a love where Ethan's fatherhood is blatantly toyed with by childish enemies. Moro is the simplest in the group, he is a mama's boy, plain and simple. All he talks about is proving his worth to Miranda. His dependence on her is reflected by his dependence on water. He's the most inflexible of the siblings, and he's likely the loneliest of them all as well. Liddy D has her daughters, Donna has her occasional playmate, and Heisenberg keeps himself busy. But Moro just has a tiny shack in an empty lake. He's just a sad little man who wants his mother's approval, because he has nothing else in life. Heisenberg is the only one in the family not desperate for Miranda's attention. He's the only one with enough sense to want out of the family, too. He's sick of Miranda controlling his life after forcing her experiments on him. If any of the siblings could truly be considered an adult, it would be Heisenberg. He's easily the most independent of the siblings, and the fact that he's willing to work with Ethan shows he can be reasonable. This is even reflected in his domain. It's a factory, a place of work, where grown-ups do business. The irony is that despite understanding how evil Miranda is and wanting to defeat her, he's guilty of the same crime she is. He kidnaps people, experiments on them, turning them into monsters for his own benefit. Miranda sees all of her children as failures, and Heisenberg sees all of his own creations the same way. Sturm is the best example. Heisenberg screwed a human up in irreversible ways, called him a failure, and then locked him in the basement to occasionally do his dirty work. Miranda only ever loved one child, and she's dead. She breaks other people in a vain attempt to get her daughter back. She and Ethan basically have the same motivation, and that's what makes their dynamic work. They both have a simple, yet unyielding desire to save their daughters. But as she is, Miranda's not capable of love. She made her children what they are, but can't be satisfied with them and refuses to love them. Ethan couldn't care less about what powers his daughter has. She's the most powerful being in the game, supposedly, but that hardly matters. If anything, he'd want her to be a normal girl. As long as she's alive and happy. It's a simple tale about how family is about giving rather than taking, especially for parents. The twist of Ethan dying and coming back as something inhuman adds another layer to this contrast. Despite being a monster in his own right, he's still a good dad. Miranda's flaws as a mother lie with her character more so than her nature. Miranda also happens to be my favorite boss in the entire franchise. Her design inverses the typical boss design of these games. Instead of making her another lumbering giant immune to damage aside from big telegraphed weak points, they gave her a fast moveset and a small frame that can be hit anywhere. Her giant black wings aren't just there to make her look cool, it also obscures her silhouette and makes her harder to hit. She also has some interesting counters. The most obvious is how the pistol isn't going to do much damage to her, especially on the higher difficulties, but it still has utility to stop her projectiles. She's immune to flashbangs, but they can't cancel out her blackout attacks and relight the room. I can't confidently say any weapon was useless in this fight aside from maybe the shotgun and the rifle too, but only after I had acquired the hand cannon. But oddly enough, one of my favorite things about Miranda is the stupid amount of health she has on the higher difficulties. Miranda attacks slightly faster and does way more damage of course, but the real challenge is making it here with enough ammo to kill her. I've seen many players complain that she has far too much health. Some even resorted to unlocking the infinite ammo in order to kill her. These same people also complained about having to return to her previous save just to collect all the ammo lying around the village. So I'm going to assume they're just bad at video games and discard their opinion. Even with a nearly fully upgraded arsenal and the hand cannon with upwards to 40 sniper rounds, 
I still had to exhaust almost my entire inventory, including a handful of pipe bombs I bought specifically because I almost didn't have enough to finish the job here. But I think this is pretty great design. Usually I'm quick to criticize a difficulty setting that just ups the health an absurd amount. But the nature of that complaint changes when we're talking about a survival horror that bases its difficulty around your limited resources. The fact that I just barely had enough to kill Miranda, despite being careful not to be wasteful throughout the game, should be a testament to the game's design. And I didn't run past most of the encounters like some people. I even fought the optional mini-bosses on my final run through the game. So I could have easily come in with more ammo. I actually didn't have any magnum ammo on me from Miranda, which is the highest damage dealer. So the game gives you more wiggle room than you might think. You're definitely intended to play Village of Shadows on New Game Plus, but by no means do you need infinite ammo. Not only does this show how well the game balances its ammo, but also this is the logical conclusion for a game about resource management on its highest difficulty setting. The one that's second after normal. Remember, there's normal, hard, and extra hard. There's no harder challenge after this, so you may as well forget about New Game Plus, when players are likely to put the game down right here. It simply focuses on testing the player one last time. This is one of the few ways I believe Village surpasses all the other games in terms of pure combat. It's got the best boss in terms of both ideas and execution in Mother Miranda. Now with my elitist tangent out of the way, let's get back to the story, or just the little bits of it that we barely talk about. Stories and games can easily feel disjointed. Like there's the story during the gameplay and the cutscenes. On top of that, many games cram in loads of flavor text to add to their worlds and narratives. The Resident Evil franchise can actually take some credit for popularizing this. And some franchises like Dark Souls have whole communities dedicated to deciphering and cluing events together through item descriptions. Reference material is common across all mediums, most commonly in the form of a databook or creator statements. Sometimes good pacing demands details get left out. It'd be tons of trouble to turn every idea into an exposition dump or a story event. So that info gets put somewhere else. But those methods leave a degree of separation from the art itself. But games seem uniquely capable of fully utilizing all of this text and lore. Developers can basically get away with cramming all of their reference material into the game itself. The simple act of dropping it into the game and letting the player find it themselves turns what could have been an exposition dump or excess lore for a data book and makes it a fun secret to discover, a collectible in its own right. Games of all kinds use this method because it's so easy for them to add it into a library or somewhere else in the menu, and that's pretty neat. I've played my share of Resident Evil games, and Village easily has my favorite mercenaries mode. Not only is there a more involved arcade element, but they also manage to make about resource management, which is what these games excel at. It's not unlike usual Resident Evil gameplay. You're given a series of encounters and you have to decide how to fight them most efficiently with what money and ammo you have. The concept has just been accelerated, and the scoring system incentivizes excellence and speed over caution. The mercenary mode has its own tips and tricks to learn. For example, selling your handgun and immediately grabbing a rifle or a shotgun is typically a good move. Or selling everything and upgrading your handgun has its merits too. For the SS ranks, you'll probably have to learn the layout of each stage to waste as little time as possible. It's a fun minigame that makes Village easier to return to. Village doesn't have the immaculate style that Jack's 55th birthday had, but it does have the design to match. I gave a lot of flack to people who used infinite ammo earlier, but I don't want to shame these people too much. Village's gunplay is good enough to appreciate on its own. You could cynically say that Village lets the players cut out what makes its genre special, but I'd rather think that Village is a flexible game that can accommodate more people without stepping on the toes of the more hardcore players. However, I want to highlight the one way Village fails to do this. By far the worst thing about this game is the yellow paint. This is a trend that's popped up in some recent games. It's such an ugly shade and it pops out so much from the rest of the game's aesthetic. I get that popping out is the point, it's meant to help guide players, but there are plenty more elegant ways to do that. Some people compare the yellow paint to the bright yellow collectibles that are common in platformers. But collectibles are by design part of the gameplay, and they tend to fit much better in bright poppy cartoon aesthetics than a survival horror game with a realistic art style. I understand this tends to happen because some playtesters spend an hour running around not knowing where to go next, and the devs don't want people to go through that after the game is released but frankly it's ruining things for the rest of us. At the very least, the item boxes shouldn't have yellow paint. You're given a prompt to break them so learning what is and is a breakable is easy. It's so rudimentary that it's shocking that they felt the need to do this. They might as well have made the barrels and boxes completely yellow, it'd at least be less distracting that way. You shouldn't have to resort to yellow paint to guide a player's eyes, and Village itself is proof of that. 
For example, in the beginning of the game, you're guided to a specific house in the village, and this house sticks out because it's the only house with a lamp lit on the porch. It can grab your attention from a distance, it fits diegetically, and it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb. The game even utilizes this during combat. Light can shoot arrows that are lit by fire, making them easier to spot from far away, and easier to dodge and counterattack in return. Yet at one point you'll be asked to look for a house with a red chimney. Despite the chimney standing out perfectly fine on its own, the chimney is strung up with a bunch of yellow on and around it. The only time when the yellow paint felt natural was during the color-coded switch sections in the lake and in Heisenberg's areas. When Heisenberg makes signs to direct Ethan to his fortress, it makes sense he'd use such a bright paint. And safety yellow makes sense in a factory setting. It even looks like old chipped paint on the ladders. But on a wooden ladder, it just looks awkward. It blatantly clashes with most of the game's color palette, and I'm not a fan. I talked a lot about Village trying to balance different elements in this video. And the yellow paint is the only aspect I felt was a blatant misstep. I think Village stood out as the Resident Evil game I wanted to talk about most, not just because it was one of my favorites, but because it's a good example of how games in decades-long franchises have a lot of expectations to balance, both in its given genre, the changing industry, and its predecessor's gameplay. The director of Village, Morimaso Sato, admitted that he wanted Village to have a wider appeal than its prequel Biohazard, which focused on recreating the gameplay from the first three Resident Evil games in modern form. And because of that, it's a far tighter package than Village. Moimasa also said he didn't want to give up good scares in this process, which is why we have the Benevita residence in a game that otherwise focuses far more on combat. It's why we only have one area with stalking enemies and a game pulled between its own story and some overarching franchise plot that's been cooking for I don't even know how long. The variety is something to admire, but as an individual it's hard not to think about what bits I want more or less of. But through it all they made a pretty great game and that got me thinking about a lot of different things. Thank you for watching, like and sub if you want to see more, and I'll see ya in the next one.